Hi, everyone. Welcome to Casual Conversations. This show is hosted by IBIA and NABIS and brings every week me, Katherine Snedeker from Pink Concussions, interviewing brain injury professionals. I'm really excited about this week because we have a big announcement. We will be launching this week in Canada, Pink Concussions Canada. And I'd like to introduce you to the person who will be leading us up in Canada. Welcome, Amy. Thanks, Catherine. Um, yeah, my name is Mamie, and my pronouns are she, her, and I live in eastern Canada in Fredericton, New Brunswick, which is the unsurrendered and unceded land of the Wolosque. And I am a postdoc currently at the Muriel McQueen Center for Family Violence Research and the Department of Sociology. And my current research and work looks at the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on domestic violence services and outreach. And before completing my PhD, I had worked in frontline domestic violence work. So I'm very interested in what Paul and Karen have to tell us today about their project. And I'm really excited to be here and to be joining Pink now in this capacity. I've been involved with them since early 2017 as a volunteer and I'm really happy to still be here this many years later and I'm trying to remember I think you emailed me how did we first or did you I remember you coming yeah. up to me in a, a, at the conference but I think we'd been talking before then yeah I emailed you and just asked if there was any chance you needed volunteers and I think for a while I just did random tasks editing things and in the last year or two working on the book in sort of a bigger capacity. So um, yeah, really happy to be involved. Do you want to share a little bit about your story that why you reached out to me in the first place? Yeah, the organization had meant a lot to me and it was one of the first resources I found when I was struggling with post-concussion symptoms. And I think Pink was just, a sense of community and a sense of belonging in a place where folks understood what I was going through. And it definitely made me feel a little bit less alone. So um, during my PhD studies, I had two concussions, one in 2014 and 2018. And what do you think the perspective of, of having that background brings to running Pink Canada? I think the, the lived experience really informs my passion for the work and especially being able to connect concussion and brain injury to domestic violence, which is the, the research that I do regularly. It's just really meaningful for me. And I yeah just want to share Pink Concussion's mission with more people and to increase the presence of the organization in Canada. So I'm really happy to be able to do that. Well, you've been a huge help. And it's one of those people that you can write at 10 o'clock at night and say, hey, I have this four page document. Could you proofread it? So I want to thank you for all your hundreds and hundreds of volunteer hours that you have done to help pink concussions. And anything else you want to say before we switch to Karen and Paul? I think that's everything for me. Yeah, I'm really interested in the research on domestic violence and brain injury and also the impacts of yoga and other mind-body interventions on concussion rehabilitation. So I'm hoping to be able to explore these different topics over the next couple of years. And we really want to build up the research capacities of PINK and hope we'll be working on that in the UK and EU. So I'm sure you'll hear lots more about that in the next coming months. From Mamie and I took the Love Your Brain yoga training. I do not have a background in yoga, but found it fascinating how to adopt yoga to people who may be challenged by some of their physical limitations to do yoga and how to work around those, which was amazing. There's so many workarounds. We did the love your brain training. When was that? Maybe it was, it was, it was heavy pandemic where we did that online. 
Yeah, I think it was about a year ago. And I was really excited to do that training because yoga and mindfulness had been such a big part of my own recovery and tools that I really relied on. Just the down regulation of the nervous system was really an important piece for me that I think I had been missing initially. So yeah, I think the impacts of, of these types of modalities are really important to explore. So I'm looking forward to that. And that is the one of the chapters that you wrote in our upcoming Pink Concussions book. Yeah. So that was the Love Your Brain yoga training uh, through Love Your Brain. And we love, love your brain. So thank you, Mimi. And please chime in as Karen, Paul, and I are talking. So welcome to the show yet again, Karen and Paul. And how are you doing? Well. Well, thank you for having us again. Well, I just, it, it, it's, it's my favorite story. Can you just introduce <laughs> yourselves and how you met? I'm Paul Van Donkler. I'm a professor in the School of Health and Exercise Sciences at UBC Okanagan in Kelowna, British Columbia. And I have been working on a partner violence related brain injury for about six or seven years now. And I am Karen Mason. And I just want to mention that we are coming from Kelowna, BC, which is on the traditional unceded ancestral territory of the Silks people, which also is, translates to Okanagan peoples. Uh, Paul and I met so almost seven years ago, start to lose track. At the time, he was, as you mentioned, a researcher and professor at University of British Columbia, Okanagan, and had till that point been doing all of his work in the area of sports concussion. I, at the time, was the executive director for the Kelowna Women's Shelter, which is a shelter and community outreach service for women fleeing violence in our community of Kelowna, BC. We were both at the time a little less middle-aged than we are now, and both single and looking for love on Tinder, Tinder of all places. <laughs> and we both swiped right and connected immediately in some amazing conversations and then met in person for a dinner that turned into a very, very long evening of better conversation than even the stuff we had had online. We fell madly in love pretty quickly. and. A few months into the relationship, I stumbled across an editorial piece about brain injury and intimate partner violence. And I had that light bulb moment that people have on this topic and thought, oh my God, we don't talk about this in the domestic violence sector work that I'm doing. And this is a big problem. So I immediately forwarded this article to my new love interest and said, what the are you doing studying athletes? We need to study women. So, so because it's Karen and, uh, and, you know, I was uh, newly in love, I decided to basically completely transform the research taking place in the lab and, and, you know, out of curiosity more than anything else, see whether there was any previous work on this. And, you know, it was a very quick search on Medline because there was only about five or 10 articles at the time. And luckily, you know, since then there, there's been a relative explosion of interest in this topic. You know, very quickly learned that Valera from Harvard was the person that is the pioneer in all of this and managed to get in touch with her not too long afterwards. And we had a couple of really long phone calls to talk through all the different things associated with trying to understand brain injury in the context of intimate partner violence and the complexity of it and the nuance. And certainly that's been something that we've worked hard to better understand over the subsequent time. And so we were able to get some fairly uh, early on, some fairly good funding through a private donor to be able to start to look at this in, in earnest. And really the approach that we took was taking all of the cool science lab-based ass assessments that we did on sport-related concussion and applying them in the context of intimate partner violence by recruiting participants who were clients from the women's shelter and incorporating all the other important things to keep in mind both from a research perspective, but maybe more importantly, from a participant safety perspective to make sure that, that it was a positive experience for them as well. So it's been incredibly fruitful. And
And, you know, I think one of the things we're going to talk a little bit more about today is kind of the, the broad scope of doing research and knowledge translation on this topic and how quickly you get from, you know, trying to understand some minute detail of brain function in the lab in this population to what, how can we use that evidence to provide better supports and, and hopefully produce better outcomes. So. And that original funding was private, but it was followed up by a government grant, true? Yeah, so we've been very fortunate. In Canada, there's quite good support for gender-based violence research. And so I've managed to get some funding, or we've managed to get some funding through the Canadian Institutes of Health Research to, for the lab-based component of it, as well as a major grant from the Department, Federal Department of Women and Gender Equality uh, that has allowed us to do you know, greatly expand the kind of range and breadth of the work that we're doing. So, I mean, what, what, what started as, you know, me reading an article and us saying, oh my gosh, we have to do something has become a pretty robust program of research. Paul now has five new PhD students in his lab, looking at a variety of different specific areas related to intimate partner violence and brain injury. And, you know, the project, which we've named SOAR, Supporting Survivors of Abuse and Brain Injury Through Research, has, has really taken off and, and allowed, allowed exploration of some areas that, that hadn't been explored before. So it's pretty exciting. What is the most surprising thing to you thus far in your research that you didn't expect to find? Mm. Well, so I'm an, I'm a neuroscientist by training, right? I'm very much focused on, on how different parts of the brain work or don't work and, and what the impact of that is on, on people. The thing that's been most surprising for me is the lack of knowledge and awareness around brain injury in intimate partner violence, and even more broad, kind of, you know, beyond the specific context of brain injury and intimate partner violence, but the barriers that are in place systemically for women who've experienced intimate partner violence and how much more of a challenge or how much higher those barriers are likely when a brain injury is part of the, the, the situation. And so that, you know, you very quickly get to these big picture questions, like how do we, how do we make the world and society better so that, so that these sorts of things are less likely to happen? And, and when they do happen, how do we make sure that there are good supports in place that are informed by the fact that brain injury is likely part of the experience? I think one of the biggest surprises for me has been to see what a lack of knowledge and training there is out there with our frontline professionals who work with women every day in the nuance and complexities of what intimate partner violence and abuse really are and trauma-informed practice. I think initially we thought we need to ensure that frontline women's shelter workers understand this issue and know what to look for and how to help women. And we need to get brain injury professionals looking after women. But what we didn't necessarily know was that brain injury clinicians, physicians at the hospital or in other contexts, paramedics, firefighters, police officers, who are often that first point of contact for women, don't even necessarily understand the effects of trauma, let alone adding the effects of brain injury to it. So that's been a really eye-opening piece for me. And we've added sort of basic trauma-informed practice awareness as part of the trainings we do specifically on brain injury and intimate partner violence to try to raise those awareness levels. And what has the feedback been from those organizations when you've reached out to them? It's been great. We've, I mean, it's, it's all piecemeal. We were speaking to someone about this yesterday that, you know, we, we want everyone to understand this as you know, Catherine, because you've been working at this for years. We want everyone to get this and to learn what they need to learn. But you can only do it bit by bit by, you know, finding and identifying and working with champions in these different groups. So we've been fortunate enough to work with a couple of cohorts of fourth year nursing students at the University of British Columbia, Okanagan. And they have, for their end of year project, developed curriculum recommendations to ensure that intimate partner violence and specifically brain injury from concussion and strangulation 
are included in the nursing school curriculum at the University of British Columbia Okanagan. So that proposal has been put forward and that would be amazing, but we need to ensure that that becomes part of the curriculum in every single nursing school around the world. We need to ensure that every social worker is being taught this stuff. We need to ensure that every physician and paramedic. So it's, we're getting great response because you meet people and they have their light bulb moment, but it's, as you know, it's incremental. And what about crossing all of Canada? Is it hard to go province to province or is I mean, I guess it depends on which sector you're talking about. You know, I think there's definitely some fed, you know, nationwide effort in terms of best practices and policies, whether it's healthcare or law enforcement or, or first, other first responders. Other things are, you know, at a provincial or, or state level where, where policies and, and the procedures that are followed are determined by provincial governments. And so that kind of adds to the complexity, right? If you want to change practices and, and have this evidence informing some of those, those policies, sometimes you would aim at a federal level, other times you might aim at a provincial level and then hope that or work towards some consistency when it's a provincial level mandate. And when I travel internationally, I think that's one of the confusions about the United States is people think that the entire United States, it's just, we have to go state by state yeah. the way you all have to go by province. Yeah, I mean, we're, there's some areas like Paul mentioned, for, for example, <laughs> we are, are one of our newest PhD students has come to us after a 25 year career with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, which is our national police force. And all the work she did was in the gender-based violence sector and involved a lot of training. So we're working with her and with the RCMP to develop a virtual reality training tool that we will pilot with some of our RCMP offices in British Columbia. But of course, the hope is that eventually, if everything happens as we think it should, that would be required training for every Royal Canadian Mounted Police officer in the country. Yeah, and I think the, the other process that people don't understand is that people cycle through their careers. So it's doing it once, but then it's doing it again. And then, you know, to try to build these things into curriculum so that, you know, the next person gets it too. It's not just a one-off training. Exactly. Because I think we talked about, you know, having those champions, those champions are everything in terms of getting the foothold and getting in the door and maybe creating some curriculum change, but those champions move on as well. So it's getting to the bottom of the curriculum and the policies that there's the end goal. Tell us about your current work and how that segues to what you want to do next. We are doing a lot of different things. So I guess, you know, there's a, there's a couple different ways of looking at it. One is more the basic science trying to understand the impact of potential brain injury and intimate partner violence. So we just published a paper late last year that looked at some cognitive motor function. It was published in Journal of Neurotrauma um, uh, using a, a, a bimanual robot arm device called a kin arm that showed, again, following the same general approach that Dr. E. Valera has used. Basically, the, the results showed that some of the deficits that were observed with this kind of cognitive motor task where people had to make quick decisions were absolutely driven by the severity of the previous brain injury experiences uh, resulting from intimate partner violence. And in addition, some of, the, some of the deficits we observed were due to interactions between that and some of the psychopathological comorbidities like PTSD and anxiety and depression. So it really brought home to us, the, the idea that this is a very complex experience, and there's a lot of nuance to how these different factors contribute to the overall function that the person is exhibiting. And that has all sorts of implications in terms of, you know, supports that are provided and any interventions that a person might think to do. So that, that was our, probably our most recent major output around this. With COVID, we've been a little bit slowed down in terms of some of that face-to-face -face data collection. So I had another graduate student who just finished her master's that was looking at some of the blood biomarkers associated with brain injury and 
uh, neuroinflammation um, from, from other populations and then applying that to, again, to women who have experienced IPD-related brain injury. You know, it's very preliminary data in not enough participants. I think we had 27 in the end uh, that we were able to collect blood from before the pandemic start, so that started. And um, kind of most consistent result of that was that, again, pretty strong relationship between some of the biomarkers that are, uh, uh, you know, proxies or are involved in the neuroinflammation process and PTSD as part of the experience of, of intimate partner violence. And so not so much related to brain injury. Like I said, still early preliminary results. So we hope to be able to start collecting data here again soon and collecting more blood so that we can look in more detail at, at again, this complex relationship between these different factors. I had a, uh, getting away from the, the lab-based uh, stuff, I have another graduate student um, who just finished who looked at the legal justice system and the response in Canada to a hypothetical situation where a woman would come to seek out legal support in, in a family law situation around child custody. And what impact the presence or absence of an IPD related brain injury would have on the strategy that would be taken from a, a, a legal perspective, both from the perspective of someone who was providing counsel for the survivor versus someone who would provide counsel for the perpetrator. And so he interviewed family law lawyers using this kind of what's called a contrastive vignette technique where brain injury either was or wasn't present in the scenario and asked them questions about how they would approach that, that from a legal perspective. And sadly, and maybe not surprisingly, the, the main result was the system is such that it's, it's mainly driven by this overall philosophy where it's the best interests of the child that are kind of at the forefront and the the status quo tends to be the the main approach around that that is that both parents should be involved and so it, it really the, the impact of a potential brain injury creates an even higher barrier for kind of justice to be appropriately served in these contexts and in fact potentially could be weaponized as a reason for legal counsel who would be representing the perpetrator to make the claim that the, the mom was not a, a, a capable parent, potentially because of the brain injury that the perpetrator had, had produced. And so it really kind of makes you go, oh, geez, that's, that's so sad that this is, a, this is the situation. And so, you know, that uh, we're working on a manuscript for that work right now and have a number of recommendations, again, around knowledge and awareness. For this topic. It's no surprise that those of us who've worked in the gender-based violence sector, we know that that women who've experienced intimate partner violence who are in situations in court to do with access and custody often have their situation weaponized against them. So this, this really isn't a surprise. It just really emphasizes, as Paul said even more, that education and awareness and training are absolutely needed if women are to get the, the support and care that they require. Yeah, and I think that there's, you know, twofold issues where, you know, I want all this research to take place. It's so important, but if the, the way the research is at least done in this country, you know, we can do this blood work, you can do these scans, but you can't give the results to the actual woman. And then, you know, you know, so the research can't benefit that individual woman, but it could, it will women in the future. And what kind of record is being created that will complicate, you know, child custody later. So, you know, you want the, you, you want the research to benefit the person that's actually, you know, putting effort in and is a $50 gift certificate to Amazon enough, you know? Yeah, it's true. I mean, we've, that's something that, you know, well, you're always walking that line because, because you don't want to re-traumatize someone. You don't want to take advantage of someone's situation. And we've found most of the women who've participated with us have been quite vocal about they're absolutely fine with knowing this 
participating in the initial pieces of the, of the scientific research may not benefit them, but if they can help other women who may have experienced the same thing, they felt quite happy about that. And there's been a lot of feeling validated to be able to put a label on the challenges they've been experiencing. They may never have even considered that a brain injury caused by him could have been part of their experience. And there's been a lot of that feeling validated, feeling supported to know that it's not, just, it's not that I'm broken, it's that he broke something in me and I'm now dealing with the repercussions of that and it's not my fault. That's been very powerful with the women we've worked with. Mimi, I think you had a question. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the impacts of the pandemic, not just on your work and how you've worked. I'm sure you've had to do a lot more online and that sort of thing, but also on the survivors that you're working with. Like speaking about things like PTSD and mental health and how these other sort of life factors really compound the effects and symptoms of brain injury. What role does COVID play in that sort of being in this state of prolonged stress for two years on top of all of these other challenges and like the economic ramifications and housing issues? Like there's just so much related to the pandemic. So I was wondering if you could speak to that at all. Well, we certainly, we haven't done any specific research or analysis on that, but like everyone, we know that incidents of intimate partner violence have increased and severity has increased. So we've actually been very interested when we are able to get women back in the lab to start asking about some of their experiences during COVID and some of the changes they might have experienced in their levels of well-being as a result. Because everything you said is absolutely true and we're all we're all struggling during COVID, but when you add all these other layers of challenge, of course it can only get worse. I think one of the one of the big ones that's that's really struck me is the increases in severity of incidents and hearing about the increases in strangulation, non-fatal strangulation in particular, and the worry around that. We've, when we first started this work, our focus was really concussion, but quickly came to add strangulation as a key piece of the brain injury and also a, a very key red flag for future death. So we've developed some, some new resources to share with frontline workers and survivors on strangulation. And that sort of somehow partly came out of COVID and hearing about the increases and the severity. With our community support network rehabilitation pilot project, we ended up, we were, we delayed starting that because it was supposed to be in person, but we adapted as everyone did and did the program online and it worked, but there was always that fear if a woman was going to participate in this rehab, if she was at home online and still with her abuser, what would that even look like? We were fortunate so far with our participants, we didn't have to deal with that, but absolutely raised extra concerns. Yeah, and the um, pivot to doing things online for research has been you know, interesting just from a how do you do research perspective. So the, the study I talked about with the interviewing the, the family law lawyers, that was all done via Zoom. And you know, it, it, there's are, there are pros and cons, uh, obviously, to in-person versus Zoom. But at the end of the day, the data was able to be collected, and and you know, we made made some good sense of it, and the interpretations are clear. With the community support network, same idea, right? It, 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 it there is that concern, and at the same time, it opens this door to other potential opportunities. So one of the things where we are in British Columbia is. You know, we're in a small city and we're surrounded by uh, rural and remote communities and and so accessing this sort of uh, potential uh, these sorts of potential supports when you're you know 30 miles from the nearest nearest town that becomes relatively feasible as long as the internet connection is is strong and so it is a different way of thinking about how to do assessments and interventions and, and measure outcomes for sure. And in our, in our pilot of the community support network, we ended up having one participant who she started the program far away, like several hours drive from where we are in Kelowna. And then she moved to Kelowna and was able to continue the program. And now she's moved out east. I think she's in New Brunswick, actually. So maybe you might be a good source for me because she is looking for some supports in New Brunswick. 
So I think that, you know, she wouldn't have been able to participate mm -hmm. in the program if we'd been doing it all in person. We also had one who was dealing with some pretty severe anxiety and wouldn't have felt comfortable leaving her home to go participate in this rehab program in an office space. So it, it was an opportunity to explore other ways of delivering this service, and it probably would be more cost effective too. Yeah, absolutely. As a as a therapist that works with, I work mo mostly with college age, but also community college students, and some of those are, you know, all different ages have gone back to to school. But I I did have a case where I was working with a woman, and the person that was using violence with her actually walked in during the session and they had had an argument and he came in, saw she was on the computer, slammed the door, was getting around, getting keys. And we decided to stay on the call with each other. And then he took her car keys and then left. Um, but it's, it's those moments where all of a sudden their space is no longer safe. You're mm -hmm. online with them and, you know, what's the protocol around that? So, you know, it's really a balance, but then the access to all the people that I've spoken through with teletherapy that wouldn't have access, you literally can do it from anywhere. I've talked to people in hallways and cars and stairwells. So yeah, definitely. And, and, and moving forward, what, you know, what would you like to see in the next year or two besides the end of COVID? Well, we're really excited about the intervention that we're doing. So we've piloted four participants at this point. It's a, it's a collaboration with a local brain injury support organization called Brain Trust Canada, where they've implemented an intervention that was originally developed by an, another organization called ABI Wellness. And so it includes a number of different components. One kind of core component is a, a neurocognitive um, exercises. So getting basically a, a focusing mainly on executive function and capacity of executive function. Mm -hmm. A second component is around physical activity and exercise. A third is around um, mindfulness and meditation. And then a fourth component is around uh, counseling support. And occupational therapy? Yep. As uh, well. So, so a lot of stuff, you know, being applied to uh, uh, this small cohort. Before the training, before we ever started, we met with folks from both organizations to walk through how to make both the program and programming itself, as well as how it was implemented at trauma informed, as Karen was mentioned earlier. So any of any of the kind of those different components, making sure that uh, the the participants were, you know, as safe as feeling as safe as possible and and providing supports when whenever um, they potentially got triggered. And so our job from a kind of evaluation perspective was to assess before and after the intervention, um, different outcome measures. And um, so we focused on a number of things related to quality of life, resiliency, um, and a number of different neurocognitive assessments. The neurocognitive assessment, uh, well, all of these we did online. For the neurocognitive assessments, we made use of the Cambridge Brain Sciences um, tool, which is, can be completely delivered online and has a, a uh, basically a huge database from which to draw comparisons. And so um, we're really excited about the possibility of looking at, you know, how some of the outcome measures uh, changed as a result of the intervention and how they compare to some potential um, normative database. And so, you know, just briefly, the main results so far are that we did see improvements in across the, across the board, pretty much. So Quality of life absolutely improved. A number of the different aspects of neurocognitive improved. Um, and interestingly, for some of the measures, there were not improvements. And some of the participants actually got a little bit worse. And one participant in particular um, was going through some challenges in life. And actually, it took her a little while to actually complete the intervention because. Um, uh, because of these challenges. 
And so the, those challenges kind of, I think, in her case, uh, kind of overwhelmed any positive changes that uh, we were hoping to see because, because life intervened, right? And I think this is, some, again, something to consider in, in terms of the complexity of this experience and how uh, interventions may, may or may not benefit people. And what, one of the pieces that we added to this, so this is, it's an existing intervention, as Paul mentioned, that was developed by ABI Wellness. Our participants were doing what they call the part-time version. It's a six-month program, and they were doing it for basically four pretty intense half days a week. So participants had to be in a position where they commit that kind of time. And so what we added, though, was the trauma-informed training for anybody who was involved with the program in terms of the brain injury support workers, the clinical counselor, the occupational therapist. But we also created a position of a patient participant navigator. And this, this individual is a clinical counselor. She also has lived experience with brain injury, and she has worked in the local Kelowna Women's Shelter. So she has, was a really good navigator to be the main touch point for the women in participating in the rehabilitation program. So she would stay in touch with them, check in how they were doing with the program, any challenges they were facing, and provide that other level of support with some of the other challenges they were dealing with that were directly IPV related. So whether it was that they needed to get hooked up with a counselor in the community, whether they needed support with filling out housing forms or getting on some housing lists, whether they were dealing with court issues and needed to be connected with resources in the community around that. And we found certainly our anecdata so far, that there's been incredible feedback from the women on having that extra piece. It's also been a great go-between for the brain injury agency and the SOAR team for her to really help navigate this process for the women. So we think that played a big role in the success we're seeing so far. And we have a new cohort of four women who are just starting and already seeing some positive progress with two of them who've been in the program for a few weeks now. And, and I just want to make sure it's clear. So that's four, four, four mornings a, a week for six months for a couple hours or how long was it? It's like four or five hours in total. They go from, I think about 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. ish. And they, they start with their aerobic exercise. So if they were doing this program in person, they have a gym set up and they'd all do it together. But when we've done it online, they've, they all do the, the park queue and, and assessment with their doctor first to ensure that they are healthy enough to participate in the aerobic exercise portions. And then they're doing their exercise on their own. So they may go for a 30 minute jog around the block before they start the program that day, or they do their other exercises. And then the mindfulness meditation aspects have been done sometimes as part of the group, but often they've done those individually as well. So it's really the cognitive exercises that they do that are the most intense for a couple of hours a day, all together on Zoom, each doing their own individual exercises, but with the representative from the Brain Injury Society working with them and shepherding through the process. And then they're doing assessments on their end in addition to the assessments we're doing and reporting back progress or issues to us on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. Wow, that's an incredibly robust program that you put together. And that navigator, is she a social worker or what, what's her background? So she's a clinical counselor. And as I said, she has lived experience with brain injury herself and also has done frontline work at Kelowna Women's Shelter with Women Fleeing Violence. So she really brings a wonderful scope of experience to the role. And she's just the most lovely human being and just incredibly empathic. So she's really connected well with the participants through the whole process. And then we've also done with the participants as part of identifying not only the issues they face as women who've experienced interpartner violence and brain injury, but to, to identify barriers that are in the system, we're doing really in-depth interviews with them early on in the participation in the project and then at the end of the rehab as well to get some sense from them of how it worked for them and what was working and what wasn't. That's amazing. And I think having that person, the glue between all the pieces and then, you know, cause you, and, and it, it, you know, you are pushing and challenging these women in ways and something comes up like they lose their housing or, you know, another medical issue or something and having that person to pull it all together. That that's really amazing how you put that, put that all on. And 
I just, uh, through Love Your Brain, I did, I think it was six weeks. Maybe it was 45 minutes once a week for six weeks where we gather in a circle. There was a concept about that we did. And then there was maybe a video and a, and a meditation we did outside of that. And then we did it as a group and talked about it. And it was, you know, it was, it was a very relatively short program, but it was really great. Like I really loved and, and even though it was so short, I'm still in contact with some of those people. So, you know, I do think we can create these virtual circles of connection. Pink Concussions has had for seven years, since 2017, we've had our support groups online. Those are peer to peer where we have moderators and there's certainly people checking. And, and if there is a problem or someone, there's some suicidal ideation, I get pinged right away. And then I, I go and I speak with that person one-on-one. -on -one. But, you know, so I do think the virtual space has a lot to give. And again, to reach people that may be moving around, especially this population is very mobile. And I've seen programs like this, not exactly, but somewhat like this, but being put together next to a shelter, but then that person moves and never completes it. Uh -huh. So I think that what you came up with is just awesome. Any, uh, any other upcoming things in Canada you'd like to share about? I, I do just want to own that, you know, we didn't come up with this. This is everything that we're, we're doing is based on this existing model. But the original notion that all these things together would be helpful were basically replicated from a much more robust version they're doing at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Arizona we got to spend some time with them and see up close and personal the incredible work they're doing there. So we've always said what we're trying to do here is like this really mini version of what they're doing, but we know all these sorts of treatment modalities and practices have shown success in brain injury. So we're certainly excited to do it. And I, I do know um, from the military perspective that, uh, uh, that veterans that that identify as male and have more so male focused roles can go and do a two or three week program and even longer. And those that identify as female that have, you know, multiple caregiving roles, they just can't get out of the system or they don't have a job at a high enough level to have that time off, or they just, they don't have the economic or the caregiving flexibility. So they can maybe do two weekends, four weeks apart. And that's a, a problem with the military to try to create programs for female veterans to come in and really focus on rehab. So great, great work you're doing. If anybody has any questions or would like to jump in, maybe do you have any other questions you'd like to ask? I think just the, the last thing I wanted to ask was people are listening from across the U.S., but also across Canada. And some folks here are working in, you know, frontline shelter positions and those types of things. So how can we help you amplify this message? Or are there ways to sort of get involved across the country, either by sort of sending people to the concussion training online course that you spoke about in the last video? Yeah, if there's any sort of ideas on how to get involved across the country with what you're doing. Wow, you'd think I paid you to ask that question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we, we would love everybody who does any kind of work or interaction with women to take the concussion awareness training tool for women's support workers. It's free. It's in French and English. It literally takes 30 or 40 minutes online to take the course. And it's just a really good overview starting point for anyone to, to learn about the prevalence of brain injury and into partner violence, signs and symptoms, and how to how to manage and support someone who's experienced it. And I think if we could if we could somehow get every shelter worker, anybody in any capacity who's working with women to at least take that course, I think that's a huge starting point. We've been doing our best to promote it and push it through Women's Shelters Canada and through our provincial agency and through speaking engagements. But it's there, it's free, and, and I think we've gotten good feedback on, on how it's increased people's awareness and changed practice in their daily work. So 
if, if anything, I would love to get more people taking that course. And we've also developed out of the course a longer kind of half day workshop that jumps off of the course but dives much more deeply into some of the topics, including strangulation. And that's the course that I am happy to provide for any agency who's interested. And then all of our resources are also available on our website at SOAR Canada. No, SOARproject.ca if people are interested in looking at those, because I think it is about champions and the more champions we can get across the country, both in Canada and the US, we know the higher visibility this issue and this problem we're going to have. How long does the course take? I, I know I took it, but I just can't remember in general. What's the like time commitment? 30 to 40 minutes. It's, so it's 30, 40 minutes, it's free online. Yeah. You just need to get that link out. Yeah, so we've Paul's put it in the chat. And he's also put in the chat about a guest speaker who's speaking at UBCO this afternoon. If you want to talk about sure, yeah. If yeah, you're Carrie, in the I, I'm on the Enigma project with Paul. I yeah. get to wave at you all there. Yeah, so Carrie from Rutgers, uh, Carrie Asapenko is going to be giving a talk on this topic from the work that she's <laughs> been doing. It, it's later today, 4 to 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And I put the uh, registration link in there if you're interested in hearing what she has to say about her experience with this. Yes. Uh, question Matt. from Nat. Hi, thank you. I very, very much appreciated the conference last year that that the SOAR conference. How amazing was that? And in, especially the fact that if someone were experiencing trauma during the event, they could request a, a counseling session that was confidential and private. That model just needs to be repeated in every single conference setting because new knowledge is empowering, but it also can be very difficult to absorb. I think that's something that is really, really important in moving through the challenges that we are facing, that we continue to face and have faced for many, many years, is helping advocates become more empowered in giving testimony to legislative bodies so that we can that we can change the policies and the delivery systems for those policies because we often create new policy but then it's not implemented and that we pass a law but the the sponsors of a law are not the ones that deliver the compliance with the law so i think that would be a great training for advocates for survivors and for program directors and even Working with the policy directors within various programs, they often don't have a lot of experience in how to implement change to yeah. policy. Thank yeah. you. I mean, you, it's, it's a great point, right? A lot of this is about behavior change. And it, at, kind of at a superficial level, especially you know, from academics like myself, who maybe <laughs> don't have a lot of experience doing this work out in the real world, things that seem really obvious, we should screen for brain injury in every shelter, you know, everywhere in, in North America and the world, because this is a problem. You know, how, how do you make sure that that, what seems like really great advice is implemented appropriately that there's you know the barriers to doing it both from the person potentially delivering it as well as the survivor that may be being asked the questions how do you make sure that they want to do that they're motivated to do that and that it actually leads to change down the road because i mean we recognize this pretty early on it's all well and good to do some cool experiments in the lab to say look here's some evidence that brain injury has likely happened in these survivors of intimate partner violence and it's great that we can use that evidence to help raise awareness and knowledge of brain injury in frontline staff and others who provide support and yet if the system isn't you know ready for that change and and that doesn't have appropriate supports in place then then the survivor is going to run into a brick wall yeah. right around moving on and 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 you know hopefully breaking free from the cycle of abuse and having a, a more successful outcome in terms of quality of life so there's a lot of work to do around changing behavior in the systems that mm -hmm. provide this support for sure nice to hear absolutely from you. i remember interacting uh, with you at the conference <laughs> thank you so much someday we'll all meet each other and 
Catherine, you've got a puppy, but he's going to become your very well-trained partner. Fifth service dog right next to me. I've had service dogs for 35 years. So, uh, well, she's finally like fallen asleep after literally destroying the room I'm in. She's finally asleep. So I do apologize for the pup. I have a 10 year old puppy in the background who is now sleeping. That's okay. Uh, we, we, we love getting to know them. I wanted to just bring up another point that Besides the policy, the change, the, the change of organizational culture, that when we also implement these changes and work on these changes, we need to look at the culture within the organizations that deliver them, like law enforcement culture or even a, a, a DV or IPV support center can have a culture. And this actually happened to me where I'm in a support group, unfortunately over three, four decades later, being a victim of IPV again, being told by my advocate within the DV support center by the support group leader, which I found out, we don't want any people with disabilities in our groups. They're so disruptive. No. <laughs> it's like, what? So, you know, ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act violation, neon sign, blink, blink, blink. But that is a fear-based organizational culture issue of the others, the different. And we're more alike than we are different in, on every single platform. And that's a culture shift of how, in what ways are we alike as opposed to in what ways are we different? Because that's when we come together. Thank you. Absolutely, and, and I think I think it's really important not to assume, oh, I, I got this, you know, I don't really know anything about this par part of the world, but I, you know, I'm a sports med person. I'm just going to jump on in. You definitely need to have a guide to go into this world and somebody with lived experience. And, and I've been in meetings where people have, you know, said things that just were from a context they just didn't understand the situation you know and the last thing you want to do is, is you know these microaggressions or just misunderstandings that you know profoundly hurt people and isolate them even further so i think it really is important to have those with and, and necco mcgregor's is a great example where their entire organization is people with lived experience Kara, you had a, a question and then I think Eddie did. Yes, hi. My name is Kara, I work with Catherine, I'm at Pink Concussions. And I was, oh, and I'm very impressed. And I just think that the, that the holistic like care coordination with, you know, traumatic brain injury is so challenging and with IPV on top of it makes it even more complicated. So it's really impressive, you know, that you're looking at this in, in this way. One question that had us better about any outreach to schools or any um, communication with the education system, just because obviously children then, you know, within a home of domestic violence and that. And so I was just wondering if you have any work in that in area at all. We have, we have not done any area specific to that. We've really stayed focused on kind of women adult survivors because, well, as Paul will say, when we first started this work, it was like this and it quickly goes like this. So. But we're, we're fortunate in Kelowna, the Kelowna Women's Shelter with whom we've partnered on this project and I used to work with has a program called Inside Out Violence Prevention Program for Youth. And it's specifically about community outreach and going directly into the schools to do work on healthy relationships and anti-violence, dating violence, that sort of thing. So that at least is happening in our community, but no, we have not been able to do anything specific to that. What about in terms of the, the wives or mothers as well? I mean, how to manage the children? I mean, it's just in terms of their duties as mothers. I think it's also an issue of, you know, leaving home. Can yeah, I mean, we're, we're working children? closely with, with our, mm -hmm. our provincial domestic violence group that, that works with providing training and employment to all of our frontline um, child protection social workers. Okay. So there, all those social workers who work specifically in child protection are going to be required as of next year to take the concussion awareness training tool for women's support workers. And there'll be an additional module on strangulation. 
so that those workers can have a clear understanding of what might be going on with some of the moms with whom they're working so they can maybe be more empathic and understanding and help them get the support they need to get better as opposed to penalizing them for having this physiological challenge. Exactly. That's about all we've gotten to on that front so far. Oh, that's great, thank you. Dr. Zussman? Hi, I'm Edie Zussman. I'm a neurosurgeon and the director of TBI and concussion research for the Piedmont Neuroscience Center in Oakland. And we thought about, you know, what are some of the ways to really spread and scale the amazing ideas in research, particularly Paul's work and Eve's work. And the Violence Against Women Act is up for reactivation. Here, it's expected to be before the U.S. Congress in March. And so we've been thinking about the idea of maybe just getting the words, I mean, it's a 300 page bill. So we've been looking at how can we get the words like including concussion screening into a section called Title V, which deals with optimized medical care for victims of domestic and partner violence. And it seems like such an easy ask. What I love about it is literally with your screening available, with your teaching available, you know, a lot of the people in the field do know how to screen for concussion. They don't know that they should be screening. So I just wanted to put it out there. We were really lucky. We were invited to present to Senator Feinstein's staff this week, and she's the sponsor for the reactivation of, of this, this really important bill. And they were super responsive. So I would just say I was going to give Catherine some kind of language if anybody else wants to kind of amplify that. You know, if it came from, you know, 50 states and as many countries as possible, maybe it would be just a little teeny piece. But then when we go into first responders for education and to social workers, it's like we, we can go ahead and cite that. I also just wanted to give a shout out to Eve and Paul. We actually cited your work with Senator Feinstein. So wow. I just wanted to say that, you know, that, 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 that that's the foundation that has now kind of matured and come of age. So there really is good literature and really responsible science. And so uh, Catherine, did I, did I say the right? Yeah, no, that's, that's great. So we'll, we'll send out, we'll work on that you know, over the next couple of days and, and send that out. Eve just put in the chat. Thank you for what you're doing. Edie. And like, we literally talked about that like a week ago and you've already gotten it done. So I uh, love it. And any way that, that as uh, pink concussions now that we have boots on the ground in Canada and the UK, EU, any way that we can pass information back between our mailing list, I think is about eight or 9,000 people that are interested in this very narrow topic. And then being on the IBIA NAVIS platform, we also have a, you know, multi-bifactorial larger groups. So anyway, we can, we can uh, cross the cross barriers, international barriers, province, states, and, and pull people together. And it was really exciting. Angela Jolie got in, got up and actually spoke about the bill. And then they had, you know, they had this time where you were to call your senator or write your email and you could see people, you know, doing the calls. It was really exciting. I can't, a couple thousand people on that daytime Zoom call to get to, to get some action on that. So I think it's a really great bill and, and we're behind it and anything we can do. So thank you for that work. We are running toward up to the end. And Karen, is there anything else that you would like to say or message you would like to give to the audience? I thank you yeah. for, for being here and giving us the opportunity to share. I, right before this, I did a, a, an extended training workshop and it was clear in this workshop that I could have stayed on all day with these people. So we're always grateful to have the opportunity to share about what we think is really a hidden public health crisis in our, in our world and appreciate all of your attention and any of the work that all of you are doing. I know that everyone on this call is, is doing their own part to help spread awareness on this issue. So together we can get some good stuff done. Yeah, definitely. And, and the, the first tagline and that has never changed that I came up with for pink concussions in 2012 was 
brain injury in women through sports, domestic violence, and military service. And people just used to go, what? What? Like, it literally just didn't pull together. And through our work and everybody else's, those people can flow a little, oh, yeah, brain injury. Like, it, and we're stronger when those silos come together, because if we can pull in the work from the military, if we can pull in the work from sports, where we really see those differences between males and females, because risk is equal when you have two teams playing soccer, you know, and, and then this, this hidden epidemic of of domestic violence you know it, it, i believe sometimes people get overwhelmed on the topic and we all need to practice self-care but i do believe that we are moving forward you know in in bringing this to light so i really appreciate you know all the work that that you're doing up there in canada and eve and others are doing in the uk i mean the us and there's a whole bunch of stuff starting in the uk a whole bunch of funding and the UK is really, you know, taking off. And then our friends in Australia, who I think have really sort of led the way with their family violence movement. So um, maybe any, any words for closing? No, nothing from me. Just thank you everyone for coming today and looking forward to the next steps with Pink Concussions Canada chapter. Yeah, and Mamie can be reached at Mamie at pinkconcussions.org. Mamie at katherineconcussions.org. Bigconcussions.org. So I'll say goodbye officially.